And this is the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, PA, part of the Smithsonian Institution. Well, look at that, man. Isn't that awful? It's almost collar, like a dog collar. That's a weapon, you see. They sell Uh, Fort Sumter, I'll bet. I'd miss Frank this way. Oh, he did his share of the work. I always let him have time to enjoy himself. No, I ain't the extra work. <laughs> Maybe it's his jokes. He's always teasing me about being too solemn. Happy to say, <laughs> why don't you give the cows a smile and be surprised how much more milk one get? <sighs> he tell me to do the same thing with Luke and Peter. I think our Negroes miss him as much as I do. I mean, hell, they sort of helped raise him. He was down in the cabin as much as he was in the house. There's no fighting yet. But the armies are getting bigger and folks is getting meaner.
I'm still a Camp Nelson. Trained in the most god-awful set of ignorant hillbillies you ever saw. When a captain orders left face half on the lineup, facing the other half. We'll take a while to put a decent army together. I hope all is well at home. You have a good overseer. Trust his advice. Don't overrule him if he decides to punish a slave. So far, it's been a lot of fun.
the Confederacy at Helios gave the Union permanent control of both Missouri and Arkansas. The Union coastal blockade became a slowly strangling noose around the Southern Confederacy. Before the end of 1861, Union ships were seizing small but important towns along the Carolina coast. The first major naval effort came in April 1862. The most outstanding naval officer of the Civil War, David G. Farley, led a Union fleet from the Gulf of Mexico into the Mississippi River. Farragut was jovial in body, but stern in body. Southern commanders had expected any Union naval effort on the Mississippi to come from the upper or northern stretch of the river, not from the Gulf of Mexico. Farragut massed the fleet at the mouth of the Mississippi. Then, in a blaze of cannon fire, his vessel steamed past two Confederate forts and three gunboats defending the lower river. On April 25th, Farragut demanded and received the surrender of the South's largest city and chief port, New Orleans. The loss of New Orleans and 80 miles of the lower Mississippi River, coming on the heels of Confederate defeats at Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson, Pea Ridge, and Shiloh, was a severe, if not crippling, blow to Southern morale. The idea of quick victory in the Civil War disappeared. Western Virginia, a military leader who fought for God with Old Testament purity. Such was Confederate General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson. By 1863, the 39-year-old soldier was the most famous commander in the world. Much of that reputation came a year earlier in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. The humorless and uncommunicative Jackson combined the elements of unpredictable plans, secrecy, speed of march, and devastating attacks on segments of the enemy army. In the spring of 1862, Jackson's so-called foot cavalry marched 676 miles in 48 days through the Shenandoah Valley. Jackson's 17,000 soldiers defeated three Union armies, totaling more than 64,000 men. Further, the Valley Campaign completely unhinged all Union strategy in Virginia that season. Jackson became the Confederate man of the hour, yet he would accept no credit for his achievements. As he told his wife in a short note, God has been our shield, and to his name be all the glory. The flamboyant Union general who created the largest army the nation ever had was George B. McClellan, a brilliant organizer but a poor fighter. Using the U.S. Navy for transport and secrecy, McClellan in the spring of 1862 transferred his army to the Virginia Peninsula between New York and James River. He cautiously advanced to within nine miles of his goal, the Confederate capital of Richmond. Then McClellan encounters General Robert E. Lee, a brilliant organizer and a superb fighter. Lee, who had just taken command of the Confederate Army, suddenly counterattacked. The Southern Days campaign began June 26 at Mechanicsville. It extended through July 1 at Mountain Beach. Lee's men rode the Union Army to the bites of the German weapons. For the moment, Richmond could breathe again. Lee, the man who had saved the city, soon became a father figure to his soldiers, as well as the major hope of the struggling Confederacy. 